Welcome to Hear the Word of God, the online and broadcast teaching ministry of the Rev. Eric Alexander. Here in the second half of Isaiah, the prophet addresses the people of Judah in view of the fact that this is going to happen to them. He sees it clearly as God gives him insight into what is going to happen. And he tells them not only that God is going to bring them under judgment, but that God is going to redeem them out of Babylon and bring them salvation. Well, all of these little oracles, these little addresses of Isaiah concern the salvation that God is going to bring to them, a people who are justly under his discipline and judgment. You'll note the way verse 14 begins and the way it's repeated in verse 16 and again in chapter 44, verse 1 and verse 6 and verse 24. Uh, It's a, a frequent repetition. This phrase, this is what the Lord says. In other words, he is saying this is not simply the word or wisdom of man, he is bringing them the word of the Lord. That is, it is the final word. It is the final word that Isaiah is being given them from God. And it's reinforced in every case, you will notice, by an emphasis on who God is, who is speaking to his people, and what the relationship is between them. So you get this uh, regular pronouncement. This is what the Lord says, so you'd better listen. And the authority is reinforced by an emphasis on who God is and what the relationship is between him and his people. Notice how it happens here, for instance, in verse 14. This is what the Lord says. Who is the Lord? Your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. And then he goes on further to describe who he is. And uh, then he describes the relationship that he has with his people. He is the Lord, your Redeemer. Halfway through verse 14, for your sake I will send to Babylon and bring down as fugitives all the Babylonians. So he is the Lord who is caring for his own people. Look at chapter 44, verse 2. This is what the Lord says. And again, he describes himself. He who made you, who formed you in the womb, and who will help you. The same in verse 6 of chapter 44. This is what the Lord says. Who is he? Israel's king and redeemer. The Lord Almighty, I am the first and I am the last. And then he goes on to describe his relationship with his people. So here is God addressing his people. And he is uh, addressing them as the creator. Verse 15, I am the Lord, your Holy One, Israel's creator. And he is the creator in two senses in this part of Isaiah. First of all, he is the creator in the sense that he is the one who made them and formed them. And in the second place, he is the one who has made them a people. That is, in his providence throughout history, he has not only created them in a physical sense and given them life and breath, he is the one who has made them a people of his own. And you find that reference being repeated several times over. But above all other things, throughout the whole of this section, he is addressing them as their Redeemer. And you will notice how that comes immediately after the intimation that this is the Lord speaking, verse 14, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. Now that is uh, something that comes again and again throughout this section. Verse 24 of chapter 44, 
This is what the Lord says, your Redeemer who formed you, and so on. Now, in verses 16 to 18, uh, Isaiah is given a word from God which goes on to expand this whole idea of God the Redeemer coming to save his people. This is what the Lord says, and he is again introducing the main theme by repeating the source of this word. This is what the Lord says, and then he refers them back, as he does again and again in the whole of this part of Isaiah, to the classic moment of redemption, which, of course, is at the Exodus, when God came to Egypt and delivered his people out of the bondage of Pharaoh and opened up a path through the Red Sea and brought them over the Red Sea and into the land of his promise, ultimately. But here, he is reminding them of this. Notice verse 16, This is what the Lord says, He who made a way through the sea, a path through the mighty waters, who drew out the chariots and horses, the army and reinforcements together, that is, of the Egyptians, and they lay there, never to rise again, extinguished, snuffed out like a wick. Now, that's one of the things that God does regularly throughout the whole Bible. When he is seeking to encourage his people, when he is bringing them an assurance of his mighty power, the thing he does again and again is to turn them back to history. And this is the vital thing about so many of these great historical passages in the Old Testament. You know that it's so easy for us to ignore, imagining that they're of secondary importance for some reason. But the vital thing about them is God is pointing us to the way we come to know him by observing how he acts down through the history of redemption. Now, the classic case in that whole context is, of course, the exodus out of Egypt. As I was saying last week, we have a great link between that and the ultimate exodus that was achieved by the Lord Jesus when on the Mount of Transfiguration he is speaking with Moses and Elijah about the exodus which he is going to accomplish at Jerusalem. And he is the Redeemer par excellence who has come to fulfill everything that the exodus out of Egypt pointed vaguely to. Now, that, therefore, is of immense importance that we need a sense of history. And I think it's a very important thing, even beyond biblical history, that Christian men and women should have a sense of the history of God's dealings, even in their own land. It's one of the reasons that it's an immensely valuable thing to read the history of revival, for example to go back into the 17th century and the 18th and the 19th and see how God came and visited his people and delivered them out of bondage and despair and hopelessness. So I'm always encouraging people. It's immensely important to have a knowledge of the past because God is not the God of today. He is not merely the God who has arisen in our modern evangelical world in the 20th century. He is the God who has been at work from the beginning of time. And so we need biblical history and we need post-biblical history and we need to grasp it and to understand it and see where our roots are. Now, we need also to be aware of our own personal history. That is to be able to look back and see the great things the Lord has done for us. Scripture is constantly telling us how important this is. To remember, God says to them, remember what you once were and how God has redeemed you and raised you up out of that bondage that you were in. The psalmist says it. 
I waited for the Lord my God, he says. At length he heard my cry, and he brought me up out of the fearful pit and from the miry clay. He set my feet upon a rock. He put a new song in my lips. That's his testimony. You see. Now it's vital for us to grasp the importance of this. But there is one great danger in it. And that is that we get stuck in the past. And that's why God goes on to say in verse 18, Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, he says, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? Now, there are two equal and opposite dangers that God's people have had all down through history. One is to live as though there were no yesterday. One is to live as though God began to do his work with our own generation. We are the people and wisdom is going to die with us, you know. But the other equal danger is to imagine that God only belongs to the past. And so God says, I am the Lord. I am he who made a way through the sea, a path through the mighty waters, who drew out the chariots and horses. Now that's God of history, you see. That's the God who says to us, I am the God of Abraham and of Isaac and Jacob. I am the God who brought your fathers up out of the land of Egypt and through the Red Sea. And he goes on giving them history lessons. But now God says to them, forget the former things. Do not dwell in the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now, the point about all that, you see, is that the God of the Bible, the God of redeeming grace, the God of saving power, the God of sovereign reign over the universe is not the great I was. He is the great I am. And he is the God who is at work in the present day. So he says, forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now, there are many ways in which this danger needs to be highlighted for us. It is the danger that some have, you know, of dwelling in the past as though God belonged to the 17th or 18th centuries or to the 19th century whichever you find yourself more comfortable in, and some people do, you know. Uh, somebody said to me a uh, year or two ago at a conference, you know, he said, I'd have been so much more com comfortable in the days of the Puritans. I know exactly what he means. But we don't live in the days of the Puritans, you know. And what we are imagining, therefore, is that God somehow or other is tied to a particular generation. And it's a very important thing for us to realize that God means us to be, in the best, most biblical sense, contemporary people. Not people who are living in the past as though God were tied to it. Now, that does not mean, of course, that we are going to be children of our age and products of the culture of our time. What it does mean is that we have recognized that there is a living God who is as active and powerful as he was in any generation past. And that he longs to display himself to his people in the contemporary world. And the world God means us to influence is the world in which we live today. The personal danger of this 
and this is another application of it, is the danger of people who live in past experience of God and of what he has done in their own lives, you know. I do remember very well when I was in Springburn Hill Church as a student, and Dr. William Fitch was our minister, and there was somebody who was, for a short time, part of that congregation. And uh, regularly used to take part in open air meetings on different uh, occasions and always gave his testimony. And his testimony was always exactly the same. It was always about something God had done in his life 25 years before. And I remember Dr. Fitch saying to me, one day, son, he always called us son. It didn't matter what age you were. You're younger than him, you're always son. He said, son, watch out for the danger that man is in because he's got stuck 25 years ago. The whole of his spiritual history ended 25 years ago. And he's going to not only stick, but collapse. Now, he was no infallible prophet, but on this occasion he was right. And he was right in the principle that there is a deadly danger in getting stuck at something God has done in the past for you. You know? And the essence of the challenge of this forget the former things is not ignore history or live lightly to what God has done in former generations or be ungrateful for the glorious things he has done in your own life. But see that I am the living God and I am eager to work and do a new thing for you now, he says. And the vital issue is not what God did for me 25 years ago, but what God is doing for me tonight. It is not what Christ was to me 30 years past, but what Christ is to me this evening. That's what really matters to God and for the sake of our own usefulness to him. So he says, forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? And what he is saying, do you notice, is I am doing another exodus. I am making a way in the desert, verse 19, and streams in the wasteland. In other words, he is creating the same saving power in the contemporary situation. But you will notice the significant thing that he brings together. One is the works I am doing in verse 19. And the other is the worship I am due in verse 20 onwards. And here are these two things together. And one of the reasons that they do not know the power of God in the present is that they are not concerned with the glory of God in their own lives in the contemporary situation. Notice how he brings this out. He must have been some preacher, Isaiah, don't you think? I, I would love to have, uh, as they say, sat under him. That always conjures up the most awful pictures of me. <laughs> I would love to sit under him this. <laughs> you know, especially when people used to say to me they'd love to sit under George Duncan. He's such a huge man. But uh, anyway, enough of my facetiousness. Um, the works I am doing, you notice in verse 19, are these. I am doing a new thing. I am making a way in the desert. 
and streams in the waste land. Now that's God's great characteristic, you see. He takes deserts and he makes them gloriously fruitful. That's what he does in our own lives. He brings streams of water into the wasteland and transforms situations like this. But tied to the works that God is doing is the worship that God is due for them. And notice the extraordinary thing he says in verse 20. The wild animals honor me. The jackals and the owls, the kind of animals that they would have regarded as the, the poorest representations of God's animal creation. The jackals, you remember in Nehemiah's day, crawl over the waste of Jerusalem. The owls are a sign of some deserted place. The wild beasts cause fear. But he says it is the wild animals, the jackals and the owls who honor me. Why? Because I provide water in the desert and streams in the wasteland. Now, why has God provided all that? To give drink to my people. My chosen people, the people I formed for myself, that they may proclaim my praise. Now, why is God bringing the streams of his salvation? Why is he appearing as the God of redeeming grace? It is in order that his people may proclaim his praises, give the worship that he is due. Now, he says... Have you done that, Jacob and Israel? Verse 22, yet you have not called upon me, O Jacob. But let me just pause there. I don't know if you know, but that is a favorite description for the believer in the Bible. The one who calls on the name of the Lord. That's a description of the believer. The unbeliever is the one who does not call on the name of the Lord. But calling on the name of the Lord is the mark of the believer. And he says, you have not called upon me, O Jacob. You have not wearied or exhausted yourselves for me, O Israel. The implication being that you have exhausted yourselves in all sorts of other interests. You have wearied yourselves for all sorts of other pursuits. But when did you exhaust yourself for the Lord? That's what he's asking. You haven't done it. You have not brought me sheep for burnt offerings, nor honored me with your sacrifices. Notice that what he is really saying is, I have done the works of my hand with grace and power amongst you, but you have not given me the worship that I am due. And that appears to be the thing that really distresses God. Have you thought about that? It's not that God is saying, but you haven't done great things among the heathen. I haven't seen your exploits among the heathen. What he is saying primarily, you will not imagine that God is indifferent about exploits among the heathen. What he is primarily saying is wrong is, you have not given me the worship that is my due. You have not expended yourself for me, says the Lord. Now notice how, again, he balances over against each other how the Lord has dealt with them and how they have dealt with the Lord. It's not just, you see, that they have been unresponsive to God. It is that they have been downright ungrateful. I have not burdened you with grain offerings, nor nagged you with demands for incense. But notice at the end of verse 24, but you have burdened me with your sins 
and wearied me with your offenses. Now, don't misunderstand that. It doesn't mean that God is saying, you have burdened me with your sins and I'm fed up with the number of sins that you have committed or that you have wearied me with your offenses and I'm weary of your constant disobedience. What he is really saying is, you have brought your transgressions to me. You have come again and again with your offenses. I have not burdened you asking you to bring me offerings. I have not wearied you with demands for incense, but you have burdened me with your sins. You have wearied me with your offenses. Because you see, what they did with God was to deny him his honor and refuse to worship him. But they used him to get forgiveness. They made use of the Lord to obtain forgiveness from Him. It's an amazing relationship, you see. Here is the ultimate distortion of the relationship between the sovereign Redeemer who is pouring the rivers of His grace upon His people. And what's their response? Their response is, Well, we will use you where it is convenient to us in order that we might have our sins dealt with. But then we will refuse to give you the honor that's due to your name. And it's so easy for us to do that, isn't it? Well, I'm bound to speak for myself. The easiest thing in the world is to slip to the point where you make God your servant instead of your being God's servant. And that's what Israel had done. You've not brought any fragr- bought any fragrant calamus for me or lavished on me the fat of your sacrifices. You, you notice what he's saying. There's, there's not, not a sacrificial thing about your lives in relation to me, God says. Not a bit of sacrifice. So there were his ungrateful people and his unresponsive people. And I I really do think that we need to recognize the great danger of just using God as our tool to obtain forgiveness. Now he says, I am he. And here is the great emphasis positively that although they have sought to use him for this, he says, I am he, even I, who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and remembers your sins no more. Now, here is where he says, review the past for me. You notice the contrast between uh, forget the former things in verse 18 and review the past for me. It almost seems as if God's contradicting himself. But you see, what he is telling them to do is not to live in past glories. But he says, you need to realize that you are a people cast upon my mercy and grace. Review the past for me. He's dealing with them as though they were in a court. Let us argue the matter together, he says. State the case for your innocence. Your first father, that can either be Adam or Abraham. Your first father sinned. Your spokesmen, they were probably the priests and false prophets. Your spokesmen rebelled against me. So I will disgrace the dignitaries of your temple and I will consign Jacob to destruction and Israel to scorn. That is in Babylon. But God remains. I am 
even I am he who blots out your transgression for my own sake and remembers your sins no more. It's a strange thing, this whole business of the omniscient God who knows everything, choosing to forget, isn't it? Isn't it amazing? You know, God says that he never forgets. I will never leave you nor forsake you. The Lord is mindful of his people. And he never forgets. But there is one area where he chooses to lose his memory altogether. And that is in relation to his people's sin. And here is this amazing thing where God forgets the past. There is the sense in which we are to do it. There is the other sense in which God already does it. That is when he brings our sins under the redeeming blood of the Lamb, then he says, your sins I will remember no more. Now, that's a promise that as we close this evening, we need to claim from God. We need to remember the danger of living in the past in its glories. But we also need to remember the danger of living in the past bowed down with guilt. Because the essence of redeeming grace is that God takes our sin and so deals with it that it is erased from his memory. Now, properly understood, that will never leave us with a light attitude to sin or with an easy pathway into transgression. What it will do is bring us to him in worship, to honor and adore and love him when we have understood it. But it is just as important not to live in past blessings as it is not to live under the guilt of past sin. Because you know what happens when you bring it to the Lord. As somebody said to me not long ago, I brought that to the Lord again and again and again and again and I can't get rid of the sense of guilt. And I said to him, you know, if Scripture is true, and if God means what he says, when you come with that sin to him again and again, what he says to you is, what sin is this? What sin is that that you're talking about? That one, Lord, that's burning at my conscience and burdening my soul. He said, I forgot all about that years ago, and I refuse to bring it back into my memory. And you and I need to do the same. Your sins I will remember no more. That's why it's such a dreadful thing to rake up other people's sins, you know. Because you're really out of sorts with God when you do that. Because he has chosen to forget them. You and I need to say, blessed be God for such grace that covers my transgression for all eternity, and he will never remember them again.
and I can look up into his face and know that he harbors none of my sin against me. That's what it means to have a Redeemer. You're listening to Hear the Word of God with the Rev. Eric Alexander, a minister in the Church of Scotland for over 50 years. To access more Bible teaching from Rev. Alexander, visit hearthewordofgod.org, where your generous contribution will help us sustain and grow this ministry. That's hearthewordofgod.org. You could choose instead to mail a check to this address, 600 Eden Road, Lancaster, Pennsylvania, 17601, or call 1-800-488-1888. This program is a presentation of the Alliance of Confessing Evangelicals. I'm Mark Daniels. Thank you for listening. Please join us again next time for Eric Alexander and Hear the Word of God.